Uh, I'll just show them the start time. Just let me know. This yeah. You're good. Okay. You're okay, we're going. You ready? Yeah. Today is August 18th, 2014. My name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Ed Woods, another volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist here at the History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Harold Andrews, Jr., who served as a pilot in the 9th Air Force during World War II. Mr. Andrews' oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans Oral History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Andrews, and thank you for participating in the project. You're most welcome. Uh, would you begin by telling us your full name and your current address, please? I'm Harold David Andrews, Jr. I'm the th second son and third child of my, my mother and dad, one of seven. Uh, I was born in Lewiston, Maine, and my son was born in the same hospital 25 years later. I came south, well, make a long story longer. Uh, sometimes uh, that's okay you, you were talking about your son born right. in the same hospital uh, he, he and I have bought a house together in McDonough Georgia and the address is 152 Nail Road okay McDonough Georgia so can you tell us just a little bit about your your early days uh, as, a, as a child and growing up in in uh, Maine Did you right uh, my dad owned a machine shop, and I followed in his footsteps. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1940, and I went to work with my dad for about a year and a half, and then went down to Fort Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation in Stratford, Connecticut, worked as a lathe operator in the experimental department. Uh, Dad used to kid me about it. He said, don't you fly any of those planes. They're just put together with bailing wire. And one day, my uncle had taken me to Canada on a business trip, and he found out that he was going to stay a couple of weeks longer, and so he gave me the money and the ticket from Monks in Canada to Bangor, Maine. And he gave me some money. He says, you can get from Bangor to Auburn any way you want to. So I got in about 2 o'clock in the morning, one of the very few times that I ever have worried about anything. There was a flea bag hotel right across from the station at Bangor, and I was on the second floor. And I thought, what am I going to do if this catches on fire? <laughs> well, that next morning I went looking for the bus station, and I happened to see a little placard in the window of the Banger House that said fly to Northeast Airlines. I said, that's for me. I walked about five miles out to what is now Dow Field and uh, bought a ticket. And when I give a talk, I tell them to wake up the crowd. I said, my first ride in an airplane was a bigger thrill than my first kiss. <laughs> Do you remember what your airline ticket cost at that time? Not exactly, but it was not very much. Okay. It was about, about 100 miles from Bangor to, to Auburn. But we landed in Waterville and then Augusta and then Auburn. And I picked my house out from the air on the first flight that I made. Well, when I got to Auburn, I called my dad, asked him to come out to the airport and pick me up. He started laughing. He says, I knew you'd do it sometime. <laughs> But uh, some reason or other, I had two things going for me. My depth perception at the time was excellent. And uh, my, no, uh, knowing where I was in relation to the countryside, for some reason, was exceptional. Because I, I knew what landmarks looked like on the ground. And I could pick them up on the air. Okay. That's why I say I saw my 
house from the air the first time I was out. Uh, so you were you were actually working at the time the the Second World War began. Is that right, correct? Right. What was? How did you become aware that the war was on? That it had begun? Well, it was kind of funny. I wanted to fly, and I tried to get in when I was 18. And at the time, requirements to become an aviation cadet, you had to be 20 and have two years of college. Well. After I got rejected from the Navy because of uh, uh, where I struck my left eyeball and the white started to grow across the pupil, they said, sorry about it, we can't use you. Well, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I went back to my doctor in Auburn the next day and I told him what I had as best I could. I couldn't even pronounce it back then. And I asked him if he knew about it. Oh, yes. Had he ever operated? Oh, yeah. I says, can you operate on me? Sure. I said, how soon? He says, tomorrow if you want it. So the very next day I had the operation. And while the eye was healing, you know, uh, the war had heated up so that they needed to lower the entrance requirements to pass an entrance exam and uh, then pass a physical. And if you met those qualifications, you became what they call a private unassigned for air aviation cadet training. But at the time they had the uh, stations at Maxwell Field and I've forgotten where the other location was, but it's so full they couldn't take me and I had 72 day furlough. But I was sworn in on the 10th of April, 42, as a private on a sign. And, uh, so where did you go once you were assigned? What's so what? Where did you go for training once? Oh, well, when I finally got my orders, I went to Maxwell Field for what they call classification and pre -filling. And that's where you lost your, your green. But the first day I was green as soldier, you have a soul. Second day I was a veteran. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had a lot of friends, met them in tent cities, what they call you could buy coat hangers at a nickel apiece. That's what you had to hang up what clothes you had on. And the first thing we heard when we got off the train was, you'll be sorry. <laughs> I never was sorry. But on the fourth day of July of 42, I notified that I was classified for uh, pilot training. You had to be either pilot training or bombardier navigator. And I wanted to fly. That's that's really the reason I got in service. It wasn't patriotic, it was because I could fly. Yeah. Somebody to supply the plane and the gas. <laughs> As luck would have it, there was a graduating class in the barracks that we were to occupy that had just graduated. So instead of waiting several weeks to get a chance to go into the classification pre-flight, we went right in. Well, usually the upper class hazed the underclass, but there was one boy in our outfit that they thought had polio, so they quarantined that one building, and the upper class couldn't get to us. <laughs> but my downfall, and still is my downfall, I can't take code. They first started with a six-word code, and when you got that, you went to eight and then to ten. Ten was as high as you had to go. Well, it took me all but one week of the time that I was there to get out of ten word. When I went to eight word, I passed it the same day. <laughs> and we uh, got on a train and went to uh, Albany, Georgia for primary flight training. And, our upperclassmen was the last full class of British cadets, and uh, I think. Uh, so the U.S. government was training British oh, yes, officers yeah, to fly. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can remember my first solo. I it was at River Field, and I bounced, and. Uh, I thought, well, he'll wash me out for that. 
I said, my instructor says, no, he said, anybody can make a bad landing. It's whether or not you can recover from it. And I had made a good recovery. And the next thing that really stood out to me, my instructor told me, he says, tighten your seat belt real good. So I tightened it what I thought was really good. Without warning, he tipped it bottom side up. And I dropped probably an inch before my belt took up. He was just laughing to beat the band because he knew that's exactly what would happen. And the next time, after we landed, he said, next time when I tell you to tighten your seat belt, I don't want you to even be able to start your fingers between your stomach and the belt. But I really love to fly upside down, and I love to do spins. And I, because of my depth perception, I seemed to make real good landings, but my instructor never could figure out what I was using as reference. Okay. But I could usually grease them in. But on one occasion, I had the Czech pilot's plane, and as I was coming in for a landing, I had a mental block. I said, I can't land this thing. And I flew it right into the ground. Well, I bounced about 75 feet in the air, and as soon as I hit the ground, they, I was okay. I just dropped the nose, dropped the throttle to it, went around, and came in, and made a good landing. My instructor said he was watching, uh, sitting on a tuba 12 bench, and he said he liked to crush it with his fingers <laughs> because the class before one of the students did the same thing, but he didn't recover, just broke the plane all to pieces. But he, fortunately, he wasn't hurt, and. Uh, what airfield was this now that you? Big Barn. What airfield were you uh, located at when you did this? That was Dar Aerotech in Albany, Georgia. Albany, it's now Georgia. A Albany Municipal Airport. Okay. And one of the things that we did that we weren't supposed to do was chase the blacks out of the pecan trees. We're not supposed to be that low down. <laughs> but uh, I really enjoyed. Primary, I've loved every plane I've ever flown. Somebody asked me, which plane did you like the best? I said, the one that I was in. How long was that, prim that period of primary flight uh, training? You got 60 hours. Okay. And in I the think aircraft? We, we got there in, sometime in September and finished in October. And moved from there to Greenville, Mississippi for what they call basic. But I met my wife to be on a blind date in Ocala, Florida. My roommate was, his sister was secretary to Ross Allen that milked the rattlesnakes at Silver Springs. And uh, we, we were out uh, on a boat uh, at the Springs when somebody hollered, come quick, he says the place you're sitting at stands is on fire. And we, our cadet clothes were hanging on a nail on the door in the room that we were staying. And fortunately, we'd pushed the door against the wall. The whole ceiling came in, but it didn't burn but one tiny hole in Sidney's cap. And this fellow that had a dry cleaner heard about it, came and picked up our uniforms and cleaned them and brought them back to us and didn't charge us a penny. About how old were you at that time? Uh, I was uh, 19. Just, 19. Yeah, I went, uh, I was 19 on the 30th of December, 41, okay. or rather 42. And, no, wait a minute, it would have been 41. What, Go ahead. What kind, of, what kind of aircraft did you train in there at all? That was what they called a Stearman, it was a bi-wing plane. Okay. There was an interesting Aside to a couple of things that happened there, there was uh, some uh, officers that were going, they were already commissioned officers that were going through pilot training. And one of the instructors didn't particularly like the officer he was training, and when he'd do anything wrong, he'd stake the stick back and forth and hit his knees. But finally, the officer got teed off, and when he did that, he just popped the stick full forward. Well, the instructor didn't have his seatbelt on, and he went out of the plane. Fortunately, he caught it through hand grips. He said he never 
did that trick on anybody again. <laughs> and another time, the two of the uh, British cadets were dogfighting, which was strictly forbidden, as well as most everything that we were doing. And they collided, came in together like that. Well, one of them got out of the plane and uh, parachuted. The other one was strictly a Britisher. He climbed out on the wing and he had his gauze ports, his hearing tubes on, climbs back in the plane and it was just going all around. Took them off and stepped out and he bailed out. But his chute didn't open until about 10 feet, 10, 20 feet above the ground and caught in a pine tree and it bent down and he didn't hit the ground. Man, that's quite a story. Yeah. Did you see that, or did you just see No, it? we saw the remains of the plane. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. We went to, uh, went to Greenville, Mississippi for basic, and the, what they call the BT-13 Volte vibrator. We had 220 horsepower engine in the uh, Stearman and 450 horsepower in the, the uh, BT-13 with a two-position prop, whereas it was a fixed-pitch prop on the steering. And I really li liked that plane, but I saw a couple of terrible accidents. Uh, one, one of them was I was ta taxiing out to hold to get onto the live runway, and two lieutenants in a, I think it was an AT-10 or something like that, took off. It got up about 100 feet in the air and the plane just went in the ground and crashed and exploded. Come to find out they had never checked their flight controls. That taught me a wonderful lesson. I always worked my controls in every direction, full stop to full stop, and looked to see that it was doing what it was supposed to. I never, never, ever didn't do that. It just became second nature. The other one, you had to see it to believe it, but uh, there again, I was waiting to take off, and a student came in and uh, was running fairly fast. And, uh, no, it was a student under the hood and his instructor, and the other student came in and was going to overtake him, and the tower called the instru instructor to go around. But he apparently didn't hear it. And just about the time they saw that he was going to hit, the student in the rear hit the right brake, swung it around so his head right into the park plane. So then he hits it, puts the left brake on, he goes back, and he comes right in sideways to the BT-13. And by his wingtip, clipped the vertical front edge of the vertical stabilizer, wiped the canopy off. My prop chewed the wing off on the right-hand side of uh, his plane, and my left wing was chewed off by the propeller of the lead plane. And they came back and they were sitting nose to nose within three inches of each other. Nobody was hurt. That's amazing. It was, yeah. Was, was there... Was there a lot of that kind of thing? Oh, yes. Just because of student. lack of experience, right. students? Yep. Yeah. I remember very distinctly the first day that I felt absolutely at ease in an airplane. I was just flying along in a BT-13, and all of a sudden it came over me that I really felt good. And uh, uh, I got my first formation flying tra training and my first night flying training on my 20th birthday there at Greenville. And a few days later, my instructor had four of us. I was on his left wing. And I was supposed to have gone into what they call echelon from his leader and his the two right and left wingmen and then the fourth man. Well, either I didn't understand it, I did something wrong, but I didn't get an echelon. I just was tight formation with him. Came right in and landed with him. And I made a better landing than he did. <laughs> well, did he ever chew me out? <laughs> and 
I told him, I said, that's because I made a better landing. Um, what, what was night flying like in those days? Uh, it's, you get used to it, but lights are deceiving. And you, you better keep it level and don't, don't ever try to fly down to a light. So you didn't really have any um, aids. It, it was just your your visual perception and, and well, that and, and the, the gyro gyro the, yeah, uh, artificial horizon. Yeah, uh, it sounds scary. Uh, all we did was take off and fly around the field and land. We didn't get, break the pattern, and they made you call a prop so that they know that you had put it in full low pitch. At, before you were on the, what we call the final approach. And fog is the killer of a lot of, because you just can't judge how high the fog is. And I, I got to where I did pretty well, except after I graduated. Uh, trying to think. My memory sometimes is not as like it used That's, to be. You're doing good. When when you graduated from uh, basic, did you go to another training? Yes, I went to what they call Twin Engine Advanced okay. at uh, Columbus, Mississippi. That's where I got my wings on the 25th of March of 1943. And we were the last full class of officers that got a reserve commission when we graduated. After that, they made them AUS so that they didn't have to pay them so much. We got a $500 a year air crew bonus for being in the reserve. reserves. And there was a few exciting things happened at uh, Columbus. We lost three pilots and one instructor one day. Uh, one, early morning one, they tried to come in the fog and crashed into the ground. And that night, uh, my instructor and I were what they called, well, no, that wasn't that, that uh, we were, had gone to Scuba, Mississippi and back, we were getting to, in line to okay. come in, and uh, you have what they call the glide slope, green, yellow, and red. And you try to stay on the green, and that'll put you right on the end of the runway. So uh, we were, Looking out there, and we could see half a dozen planes all in a line coming in. And all of a sudden, the lights went out on one plane. And we thought that was kind of funny. When we got in and landed, they called down and said, Do you know, did you see anything odd happen? We told them about it. And two of the boys that were in my class failed to check the gas which was one of the most important things to remember. And they ran out of gas and just went on in. But the one that you have to see it to believe it, and then you still don't believe it, yeah. was my instructor and I were uh, what they call control ship at an auxiliary field. We had control of the planes. Well, all of a sudden we see two planes, uh, two AT-10s, one right on top of the other, about 10 feet higher than the other one, so f far advanced that he couldn't see the plane below him, and the fellow in below couldn't see the fellow in above him. Well, so my instructor and I didn't know what to do because if we called and the wrong one responded, they'd crash in the air, and if we didn't call, they'd probably cra crash on the ground. Well, we decided we'd just have to wait it out and see what happens. Well, the first plane came in and made a terrible landing. It started to bounce. The second plane came right over his, his head and made a beautiful landing. And when the guy jumped over him, they turned around and taxied back. Nobody was hurt. <laughs> I guess there was a lot of bouncing in landing just from some oh, of yeah. the stories. Oh, yeah. It's awfully easy to bounce the plane. So would you say that's the hardest part of... Uh... Well, uh, unless, uh, unless you're... Uh, uh, depth perception is real good. Now they had a little uh, 
tester uh, two posts on strings and you were supposed to line them up. And the closer you lined them up, the better your depth was. Well, I, mine was absolutely perfect. Every time they, I'd get them right exactly where they should be. And they make me do it over and over again. But that was just a gift of God. And that had an awful lot to do with my. Now, when I messed up a landing, I did a good job. <laughs> So when, when you finished uh, your advanced training there, where right. did you go next? Well, then I was assigned to Will Rogers Field at Oklahoma, Oklahoma. City, in the 50th Squadron, a group that had come back from Africa. And the first time, see, an A-20 only, is only about as wide as this chair. There's no co-pilot. So we hadn't ever flown anything higher than 450 horsepower. No, I'll take that back. I flew an AT6. Uh, I had 550. But, uh, so they had a B-25. They'd put you in the co-pilot seat and let you learn uh, how it felt. Well, not me. I'm up there and just doing everything. And all of a sudden, uh, this horrible odor. I had every one of them in the back end of the plane at <laughs> seasick. <laughs> I, I, I really loved that B-25. I didn't fly it in combat, but I flew it quite a bit in uh, training there in Will Rogers Field. Well, uh, how, how did you get selected for multi-engine uh, That was flying. a selection based on my instructors. Okay. He said, I, he asked me what would I like to fly. I said either P-38s or A-20s, with A-20s being my preferred. And there's 19 openings out of a class of about over 200. And he got me one of those Outstanding. assignments. You don't hear much about the A-20. That's what irks me. Uh, that's what... Uh, what did you like about the airplane? Beg pardon? What did you like about the airplane? What did I like about the Air Force? The, no, the airplane, the A-20. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Why? Why the A-20 over other types of aircraft? Well, like I say, uh, I seem to transition to any plane quite, quite easily, and I loved the plane that I was flying in. <laughs> uh, one time out at Little Rogers, a plane had crashed, and a couple of the chaplains would want somebody to fly them over the crash scene, so, so. Uh, I got a B-25, got them in there. Of course, I was only 20 years old then. And uh, we flew over, and about the time we started flying over, both engines just started shaking in their cells. The plane had a bad habit of fouling the plugs about every four hours of flying, which it shouldn't do. And so I declared an emergency so that I could come in straight in without flying the pattern. And I look back on the final approach, and the two chaplains are applying their trade. <laughs> they were, well, they made a good landing, but that was the one time that I chewed a crew chief out. I said, either you fix those where they can run more than four hours, or you change them. Well, they just bought it on changing, not quite enough of this, quite enough of that. So I helped them change both engines, which very few pilots ever did. But I just love to work on them and know everything that I could, could about an airplane. And I ground on it for an hour. Then I went in and uh, got me a co-pilot and a flight engineer. And uh, I was going to take it up for what they call slow time. It's where you go up over the field and fly around for two hours breaking in those engines. Okay. And then if anything goes wrong, you can get them back to the so uh, everything checked out. I taxied out to the head of the runway, run the engines up, and everything just checked perfect. And called the tower. I said, Will Rogers Field from 813. This is a double engine change slow time. Keep your eye on me. So I started down the runway. And normally you can get in the air in a B-25 that's not heavily loaded in a, at about 90 miles an hour. But I, for some reason, 
kept it on the ground until I had 160 miles an hour, and I was about 500 feet from the end of the runway. Well, at the end of the runway, there was a colored fellow working on the road that went by, and he saw that plane coming and not airborne yet. Several went over his shoulder, and he was running to beat the band. Well, I was so used to uh, flying that I was looking out the left side of the plane, and the props were in the, uh, on my right hand. And uh, all of a sudden, my co-pilot punched me on the shoulder, and he says, look. I looked at the RPM. There's a dual needle, one, for, one needle for each of the two engines on the same okay. instrument. I looked out, and there's the prop standing still feathered, and I wasn't 50 feet in the air. So I immediately reached up to trim it, and I trimmed it the wrong way momentarily. I sure trimmed it back in a hurry. And I was headed right into downtown Oklahoma City. And so I unfeathered it, and I got back at a little, little bit of speed, but I was climbing fairly flat. And I could hear my instructor from Columbus as though he was sitting right there in the cockpit with me. I said, remember one thing, Dave, whenever you're taking a twin-engine airplane into the air, get single-engine flying speed before you leave the ground. And I could actually hear his voice. So I, I always said that when I called the tower, I said, well, Rogers Field, 813, emergency landing, single engine. I said, they didn't need a radio. They could hear me without it. <laughs> so I, uh, I went according to the, the book for two times to unfeather and start it going. It start right up once I unfeathered it. But as soon as I took my finger off the feathering button, it go right back to feather. And so the th third time I said, I was getting closer into Oklahoma City. I said, the heck with the tech horse, and I held it until I had 2,300 RPM instead of 900. Well, that boosted my speed up. I was about 500 feet in the air by then. And I called the tower, and they told me I could have any runway I wanted. The wind was only five miles an hour. So I told him what runway I was selecting, and I turned to my co-pilot, and I said, when I signal for gear and flaps, you drop them. If they don't come down, it's just too bad we're, we're going in. <laughs> well, I came in, and I saw that I probably would hit a little hard, so I come back on the yoke and didn't, didn't kiss the runway. Uh, probably the softest landing I ever <laughs> ran down the length of the runway and turned it off on the taxiway fire engines and the ambulance chasing me. I said, go on home, boy, I don't need you. <laughs> and got back to the ramp. They t towed the airplane to the ramp. And we got in an argument about what happened. And there's a little second lieutenant maintenance officer that was kind of a little wise guy. And he t said the Hamilton standard doesn't ever feather itself like uh, uh, Curtis Electric. And we argued back and forth. And he said, well, maybe you were just trying to show off. I can't repeat the words that I told her. And I said, well, get your parachute and I'll take you up in this thing right now. Right? Well, no, 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 that's not necessary. I said, well, don't you ever tell anybody what they did in their cockpit when you weren't there. And what, were you a first lieutenant at that time? No, I was a second you lieutenant. You were a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this about seven foot tall prop specialist from Tennessee with a Tennessee draw. He says, Lieutenant Andrews is right. He said, the prop feathered itself. They said, well, what happened? He says, I ain't going to tell you, but I'll show you. So he under, took the cowling off, got the prop governor, took it. Uh, a bunch of us in the Jeep over to the depot, and they had a test stand where you put the prop governor on it, and there was a slanted back, back glass, and in full low pitch, uh, the uh, high pressure leaf valve is open so that you never get, see, high, full low, low pitch is actually a a tight screw so that the engine can actually run fast. 
people it's supposed to kick in at uh, 1,100 pounds because it takes 1,600 pounds to unfeather a uh, prop. And uh, it got going and got to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 5,200. It broke loose and a little grain of sand came down the lighted glass. But it, it had stuck the uh, high pressure relief valve so it couldn't re re release. And I, they, they didn't tell you, t teach you that. Because had I known, I could just come back to full low pitch on that one side and you come back without any trouble. But, uh, you know, I, I was extremely lucky. I like to tell about the first time I took an A20 into the air. It was on the 30th of April of 43. Uh, everything checked out okay. I took off. And I was at 7,000 feet. I immediately caught up. Caught up with the airplane. <laughs> and, and was that in Mississippi when you first flew an A-20? First flew what? When you first flew the A-20? Is that no, was, no. It was in uh, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Well, how long, how long were you in Oklahoma City? Did you deploy from... from well, uh, I went... Uh, let's see... I think it was about the 3rd or 4th of October, the whole 416th okay. uh, moved to uh, Tampa, Florida. And my w w wife to be, the one that the word Jackie is written on the gun cover in shock on every flight. And, uh, Sometimes my train of thought jumps the rails. <laughs> it's okay. So w when did you actually leave for Europe? Uh, we left, uh, well, I've got to get you a little bit farther on. Okay. We got down to Tampa, and Jackie lived in Ocala, which was 90 miles away, and I was like a homing pigeon. I'd go up and fly over the house, and she came out and waved, and I'd fly back. <laughs> Well, one night, uh, one day they had me take a plane, uh, the A-20 from Tampa to uh, Warner Robins in Georgia to have an old bomb site installed in it. Well, like I say, I was a homing pigeon to Ocala, but from Ocala I was supposed to go to Tallahassee and spend the night because it was so late getting the plane ready for me. And I knew it within five minutes that something was terribly wrong because I was flying the heading that I was supposed to be flying, but uh, it wasn't following the track. So I turned on the radio range and happened to get Valdosta, Georgia. And uh, I bracketed the beam until I came in. I buzzed the field to see where I was, and uh, I, could, I didn't know what frequency they were on, so I knew they'd give me the biscuit gun, either red or green light. And they let, gave me the green light, and I landed. Uh, it was a advanced training, twin engine advanced training field at the time, and a group of them were just about ready to uh, get their commissions, and they wanted to see an A-20. I said, anybody that's out here to help me pre-flight it in the morning, I'll let them get up in the cockpit and take a look. I had about 100 cadets. <laughs> And I lined up with a runway to go to Warner Robins, and I called the tower and I said, is this runway actually 360 degrees? They said, yes. I said, I'm showing 20 degrees. I had a 20 degree error in my compass in the cockpit. And when I corrected 20 degrees, I hit Warner Robins right on the nose. I got there and they said, the field is closed. Well, hey, I said, that's just tough. I said, I can see you and I'm coming in. And in other words, they didn't want them flying out of the field. Okay. Oh, yeah, and then I got back to uh, Tampa. And I got orders to be at uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana with the 416th 
was, uh, I didn't know it until I got there. They were leaving that day, the first day of November, to go to Laurel, Mississippi. That's where we, our last field before we uh, went, decided to go overseas. And there was another time that I learned a very good lesson. I uh, was going to lead a night flight from Laurel to Meridian to Jackson and back. And I checked my left outboard tank. It was full. My left inboard, the right inboard. And I thought, well, the left outboard would be full. And coming back from Jackson to Meridian, I had one on each wing flying on my exhaust. And all of a sudden, my right engine quit. And I thought that was funny. And I looked at my fuel selector. Yeah, indicator said zero on that one. I'd flown it, it probably wasn't, but maybe half full or less when I took off. You took off. Mm. Oh, the mistakes that we do make. And you know, they, well, they used to say that uh, if you lived 50 hours after you got your wings, you had a chance of living through the war because we were hotter than the $2 pistol. <laughs> We thought nobody could fly quite, quite like we could. And when I, I was at Lake Charles on temporary duty, taking gunners out over the Gulf, practice firing their guns. And I'd get down, as soon as I was out of sight of the field, I'd get down on the deck and of the Gulf of Mexico, and I'd go by this lighthouse that I'd have to wave up to the lighthouse keeper that was on the ground. Well, I'd go to New Orleans, and there was one building in New Orleans that had a green roof that stood out among all the rest. And I'd turn around and come back. Well, I had this B-25 pilot that had never been in an A-20. He wanted to have a ride, so I obliged him. Well, we got back to the uh, lighthouse, and I waved to the uh, groundskeeper again. And for some reason, I started to climb, and I got about 1,500 feet, and one engine quit. And a few seconds later, the second engine quit. I thought, oh, my God. So I set up to make a belly landing in the marsh, and I checked my fuel. Both of the tanks that I thought I was on were empty. No, they were full, and the two that I, which I shouldn't have taken off on were empty. And about 300 feet from making the belly landing, the engines came back on. That B-25 pilot was rather impressed. <laughs> Another thing that I did that was not strictly legitimate was there at Lake Charles, it's not too far from Beaumont and Orange, Texas. There's a big br high bridge that goes across and a bunch of us were flying under the bridge trying to get up into the clouds again before somebody could get our tail number. Well, I was going to be smart and wait till there was broken clouds and I could see the bridge in the break and I'd just do a split S and go down and go under and come back up before they'd get my tail number. Well, unfortunately, I was a little too close and I knew that I could not make it across the top. And I wasn't too sure I could make it if I went under the bottom. Well, I had a sergeant that wanted to ride in the nose of the a-20, and uh, I, I just knew that I had to clear it. And about four feet off the water, I broke the bottom of the curve and started back up. Well, uh, I got back to base, and the sergeant jumped out of the plane. He came back to me, he says, I may be just a sergeant and you're a lieutenant. He says, but if you ever do that to me again, I'll kill you. <laughs> well, I had my share of being a hot pilot. One time I had to go from Oklahoma City to Austin, Texas for a set of spark plugs for a B-25 that was down. And uh, I was losing oil, so I landed in Fort Worth and checked it. And then I went into Austin. And Austin was a much shorter field. I was actually doing 70 miles an hour, I came to the end of the runway and I had to make a full right turn onto the taxi. I made it. <laughs> but boy, I sure 
use every bit of the runway taken off to clear the telephone poles. Well, when, when you went to Europe, did you fly? Did you fly an aircraft to Europe, or did you? No, we, we t uh, took the, the French line, I call them the, okay. the whole The whole squadron? Went? The, the whole group, yeah. The whole group. See, there's four squadrons in a group. And where were you based in Europe? At where? Where were you based? Where was your airfield, your home airfield? Oh, Weathersfield. Well, I flew 55 missions out of Weathersfield, then another five out of Mil uh, Villaroche, Milan, uh, south of Paris, southwest of Paris, and then I transitioned to the A-26. I only got five missions in the A-26. Uh, there again, I loved that plane, but on my first raid with that plane, and I was one of the f first to fly a the plane as a group mission. As a matter of fact, I've got a, a copy of uh, two, two books for you, and uh, it shows when we find it on the 17th of November of 44, where he took it into the air for the first time. But I opened my bottom bay doors and there's a red arming light that's supposed to come on to indicate that your doors are open mm -hmm. and the arming system is hot. But it didn't come on. So I wondered what I was going to do because we were on the bomb run. So I just shook the plane, beat the band, and my poor gunner in the back didn't know what was going on. But just at the last second, the light came on. And see, we drop on the leader when his first bomb comes out of his plane. You're supposed to be ready to do either in salvo or in train. They tell you at briefing what, which you're going to do. And uh, the closer you can fly together, the better the bomb pattern on the ground. And strangely enough, on my last, the 65th mission, we got a superior. We also, this <coughs> pin here somewhere is the uh, presidential unit citation oh, and, and for yeah. our group. Uh, for having taken out the... The blue ribbon there? Yeah. On your right, yeah. To have taken out the last bridge across the Seine between Paris and Le Havre. What were some of the targets that you uh, had missions to? Well, to start with, we had what they call the no-ball target. That was a, a launching sites for the V-1 uh, ramjet. And... That, that was actually a waste of time because in two or three days they could have it all back. But Hitler, uh, not Hitler, but uh, Churchill wanted it. And so that's what, we, then we started bombing railroad roundhouses and terminals and tracks and like that, and marshalling yards. And was that before or after D-Day? That was before and, before and after. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you have any problems with uh, German uh, fighters? I never saw a German fighter. We always had uh, fighter protection. We had what they called high cover, which was P-38s, and then we had the low cover, which was just slightly above us, uh, P-50, P-47, P-51s, and sometimes Spitfires. So they didn't bother to come in. Although uh, after I left, a few of them did get shot down when we tried to do strafing. I never did do any strafing, just didn't call for it. But uh, on D-Day, I didn't go down to the beachhead because I was not on what they call the loading list. Uh, they select the pilots, the planes, all of the information of where you're going, what your turns are going to be, and like that. But uh, that night at about 7 o'clock, the French underground reported to London that uh, Hitler was releasing the tanks that he held back up there in the Clay area. And because the 416th had the bombing accuracy record, they sent us. And 
Normally it took three hours from the time you got a field order until you were assembled and on the way to the target. We were on the way with 37 airplanes in one, one hour after they heard about it. We crossed the channel at about 150 feet off the water so radar couldn't pick us up. We had to lift up to keep from running into the cliffs. And there's a B-26 outfit coming out. They just switched the guns over on us. I don't think we've ever seen as concentrated and as mixed firing of uh, ammunition from the Germans. Well, the funny part of it was nobody, we were flying and nobody was falling. And uh, I thought I was flying a sieve with all the tracers coming through. And uh, I happened to glance out the side window and I saw this German officer at the barn door firing a Luger at us. Well, it tickled me. me. I thought it was funny. It made me relax. And uh, I think that probably is one of the reasons that I didn't get it. But when we came in over the target, my flight leader, after we dropped, made a left turn away from me. And if he'd made a right turn toward me, it would have been me that was shot down. It was the boy on the left wing. His engine caught fire, and of course he's looking out the right-hand side of his plane, so he couldn't see it was on fire. And uh, we're supposed to maintain radio silence so they won't know where we were. And I said, to heck with radio silence. They know where we are. <laughs> and I called him told him he was on fire and he better get out. And he did. I watched him jettison the canopy, pull the plane just as steep as he could, stand up in the slipstream, and it took him over the tail. And a lot of people that tried to evacuate got killed by hitting that yeah. tail structure. But he made it nice and clear. Well, I didn't realize it, but I thought his two gunners must have been killed. But they weren't. They got out. Uh, we had we lost five planes out of the 37, and of, uh, there were only three in the whole 37 that didn't have a scratch, and I was one of them. Just pure luck. Hmm. So. After D-Day, what was the what what kind of targets was the the, the high command uh, bridges, uh, troop uh, concentrations, uh, railroads, and uh, crossroads? Oh, they said it was pitiful to see the, the slaughter that we did. Uh, now you know I, I went back to England and France last year for the first time since I'd left it. And then my granddaughter and my son was with me. They wanted me to go for this year, the 70th. So we went. And okay. uh, that's when we, my granddaughter got me this jacket. And I think, I've forgotten who got me the cap. Would you believe in order to even get it on my head, I had to pay $78 to have it cut out. <laughs> well, tell us about the floppy hat. What, what's well, this is what they call the 50 mission crush. Now, in the tan caps, are much easier. These are for cooler weather. But you had to fly 50 missions before you could take the grommet out that okay. kept it nice and straight. And I earned it. Yes. And the only piece of, uh, only award that I got was the air medal. It became automatic if you completed five missions in a row and didn't, didn't abort or anything, you were automatically given the air medal. Well, I got 13 of them. <laughs> really? Wow. And how many missions did you say you flew total? S 65 total. 65. First, we were supposed to fly 50, and then they upped it to 65. Sometimes it seemed like it wasn't quite fair to the uh, boys in the heavies because they flew a long, a higher and a lot longer mission and didn't get near as many awards like that. So when you flew your 65th mission, did you come back to the States? Well, I uh, had to wait until they got, got orders transferring me back. And, uh, 
That was on the 2nd of December. On the 12th, I got my orders. I went to Paris. The weather's so bad, I didn't get to leave until the 16th. We stayed in one of Rothschild's mansions waiting. And uh, that was the day before the Battle of the Ball started. Mm. I thought, sure, they'd call me back, but they didn't. And, uh, of course, as a wingman, you don't see where your bombs go. You don't hardly see the ground. But uh, the pilot of the C-47 that took me to England let me handle the controls. And we were down low enough that I could see some of the destruction that I'd done. And uh, this, this year, I went to uh, 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 Cherbourg. Okay. We, we bombed Cherbourg. And you'd never know that a bomb had ever struck there. But boy, one, one particular mission, it was so timed that you better be on the second, your chance to run in with a load of bomb. Also, uh, there was a young French history teacher that somehow got wind of uh, the 416th bomb that town. And uh, he got in contact with the archives, 416th archives, and the archivist called me and asked me if I remembered a particular mission. And I said, well, I'll have to look it up. And sure enough, I was on that mission. I was flying what they call a window mission, where you drop tin foil to mess up the Germans' radar. And somehow or other, we, the three window ships, the leader got behind the formation they were supposed to protect instead of in front. So I poured the coal to it, flew under them, and I'd rack it up this way and this way. And as soon as I saw the bomb start to come out, I just screwed it over this way. And I, I told him that I said, I want to inform you that we did not bomb the town. We bombed a fuel dump that Hitler had there. And the reason he thought we bombed the town, another A-20 group accidentally did bomb the town the day before. And we, we met him while I was over there this year, spent the day with him, uh, had a really, really nice time. Also, uh, we met a group from Holland last year, and they were anxious to see us again. They took us around for a day. Well, when you when you arrived back in in uh, the U.S., where where did you go? Where were you assigned? What did you do? Uh, I was assigned to officers maintenance engineering class in uh, Chanute Field in Rantoul, Illinois. I guess because of my machine shop background, and that that was a rather an interesting little episode. Uh, there were two groups of us. Uh, and there was an A-26. None, none of them had flown the one except me. And one, the first week, we took the engine out of the plane, what they called pickled it, took all the accessories off, pickled the engine. The next week, we unpickled it, put the accessories back on, and then put it back in the engine. Well, one of the uh, uh, classmates, dropped a nut down in the blower section of our engine. And I went to the electric department and somebody had rigged up a flexible magnet and I stuck it down the throat of the, where the carburetor sat and the luck would have it, I got the nut out. Well, when they backed the A26 out to the ramp to start the engines, I made sure that I was in the pilot seat and I made the bet that I would fire the engines off on the first energize. Back then you had a wheel that you energized and then engaged and that turned the crank. And I said that I'll do it on both of them. They didn't believe me. Their bets went around that field to beat the band. So I get in, crank it up, one blade came up a third of the turn, it fired and started. 
I think I was as surprised as anybody. <laughs> Did the same thing on the other engine, the plum cold engine. I was hoping I'd find a picture of a smile on my face when I sat on the one that's in the New England Air Museum. Uh, that was the first time since I since 1945 that I had sat in the seat of an A26. The last mission that I flew, uh, I didn't know it, but I had apparently quite some structural damage to my rudder. But I came in, made a good landing. We had taxi around across what they call the live runway because we landed 15 seconds apart on alternate sides of the runway. And uh, my CO was up at the head of the line I was right on the edge of the runway. I was nose to tail to him, and there were three other A-26s nose to tail to me. And uh, my gunner had come across into my cockpit area because there was room for a, a co-pilot or a cannoneer, the one on the A-26s that had the 75 millimeter cannon. And, uh, there was a break in the landing pattern because we lost one of the planes that day. And so he moved across and I moved up to the edge. Well, the last man to land landed on my side of the runway. And when he put weight on what he thought was a tire, it had been shot out. And, and it looked like he was going to come down and run, just T-bone me. But uh, if, he, if I left the runway, he would have. Well, I was sitting there with idling about 1100 RPM with the brake set. And when I saw him hit, I just slammed 4,000 horses to the fireball. But I didn't want to run out in front of him unless I had to. And I could give him my tail because I knew my gunner was safe. And it would give the plane behind me a chance to not be in the, see if, if we had collided, it'd probably take the rest of the planes behind us. So uh, he came by. And he had ground his magnesium wheel right down to the axle and just did miss my plane maybe a foot or so. Well, I came back on the power and I pushed on the brakes and nothing happened. I looked down, my knees were just going. <laughs> I called the tower and I said, you have to send a tug. I can't move this thing. <laughs> and that was the last flight I made in A26. And that was in, uh, where was that? That was in uh, Villa Roche Malone. Okay. Well, uh, we went there last year and this year. But unfortunately this year, we had a terrible hailstorm that tore up a lot of stuff there at Malone. Uh, uh, all, all around, uh, it was one of the worst hailstorms France had had, and they said over 20 years. Well, that's beautiful country. And of course, you, you don't, as a pilot, usually about 12,000 feet, you don't see anything but what looks flat, and unless it's a mountain in front of you. And, uh, so, uh, Have you gone to reunions uh, with well, your group? Well, I went to my first reunion in 1981, and I didn't get a chance to go again until 2011. Incidentally, it's three years ago today that my wife died. And, uh, Did you want to hold up that uh, your shadow box here? Oh. Then just ex explain what that is. My oldest brother, oldest daughter husband made this for me. And explain to Jackie. That, that was, a, this was, the picture itself was taken on the 11th day of April of 44. It was the first time that I put my name on, in shock on my gun covers. That was my third mission. Okay, is, is there anything else here that you'd like to 
have included on that. I filled this out for the diary. I also filled on out for the history. But it messed up and didn't get it. I know it's in here somewhere. Must be. What is it you're looking for? It's a, it's a wire bound uh, book. I don't know whether you'd be interested in these or not, but these are the uh, 416th Spawn Group reunion newsletters. Hold it up so that people can see the cover. And that's all the all of the veterans that made it to the. So you went in 2011 and 2012. Uh, I have that in here somewhere, but you, you can see the en engine and the nose of the A26 that was flown back to the states and that we. Uh, have them completely re renovated. Wow. If you think this is bad, you should see the house. <laughs> <laughs> so did, you married your wife while you were in the service, right? Beg pardon? What year did you and your wife marry? Uh, Ten days after I got back from overseas. Oh, really? Jan okay. January of 45. 45. So after you left the uh, the Army Air Force, after you left the service, what did you do? Well, I went back to Ocala and, uh, and worked for a company that converted uh, C-47s back to DC-3s. Did all the uh, removed all the wiring that was not necessary and connected the wires that. When they took off the wings for inspection, they had to hmm. rewire them. And uh, I cheated a little bit. The second plane that they had brought in had a complete electrical diagram. <laughs> so I, I wasn't guessing. I knew what I was doing, <laughs> just as long as I could read. Well, how, how many children did you have? Just the son. Just the son, okay. Yeah. And he and, and I have bought a house in McDonald's and living there. He moved me in two days. Wow. What does he do for a living? He's a kitchen and bath designer for Lowe's. Oh, great. He's been the top salesman in the region for several years now. He can sell ice boxes to Eskimos. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, his method of selling is not pressuring them. It's trying to find out what they, what they can afford and what they really need. You know, whether what they're thinking of buying is the best for the money. Yeah. And also, he's a jack of all trades. Anything goes wrong around the building, they call on him. Well, we're, we're coming toward the end of this. Is, is, is there anything, any final comment you'd like to make or, or you know, just it's anything you want to say about anything? Well, the only thing that I can say is that I didn't go into the service for really patriotic reason. And the second thing is, when I went back both times, I didn't realize how small a cog I was in a great big operation. But I'm sure that our getting that train probably saved a lot of lives. Yeah. And bombing that uh, fuel dump. It cost the Germans a lot of people. Was that 
Ploiesti? Is that the fuel dump you're talking no, about? No, no, that was down in the Mediterranean. Okay. Uh, the, the, this was just a in random France. fuel dump. That I guess the underground told them where it was. And we, I didn't see the results, but, but I understand that we really did a job on it. And we didn't lose a plane on that mission. Well, we really appreciate you sharing your time with us and your experiences. Oh, and you're most welcome. Thank you for that, and also thank you for your service. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. That was great.